to the show. I'm Dooner and that's Michael Vincent the Dude. Hey, welcome everybody. You got me with the uh, cowbell. I got myself. There's already gremlins in the system. Already summer, <laughs> already are. Hey, man, summer is here, dude. It is hot and humid out there in Freight Alley. Yeah, you know, it might feel better to be high up in the sky. Uh, we talk be. about drone delivery all of the time, don't we? Yeah, we absolutely well, do. What about hang glider delivery? Our buddy Matt McClellan over at, at Covenant, he jumped up in a hang glider and let's see what he did. He cut this promo. Hey, I want to give a quick plug to Freight Waves and the upcoming Future Freight Conference in November right here in, do my Vanna White here, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm on top of Lookout Mountain flying my hang glider right now. One of my favorite things to do, I'm a Lookout Mountain or Chattanooga resident. And if you come to Future of Freight, which you need to for all kinds of reasons, from incredible keynotes to great events to fantastic sessions, um, you need to come and stay a few days later or come a few days early. I know several friends of mine in the industry that do not live here that are bringing four or five, six members of their company to kind of have little off-site meetings at different places around town, um, in one case before the conference and another case afterwards. But it is a great place to network. And as far as I'm concerned, a premier place to have a conference. Chicago's great, but come on. It's Chattanooga. This is the next big freight town. Come on. You guys know it. It's going to happen. Chattanooga is where it's at. Freight Waves, Future of Freight, 2021, November. I think it's like 6, 7, 8, 8, 9, 10. Look it up on the website. Um, obviously, my hands are a little full right now. I can't pull it up and look at it. Future of Freight, 2021. Craig Fuller and his team have done a great job putting together a great plan. Be there. It was late yesterday, man. He was delivering my pizza. Uh, what a wild man. So he, I guess he's an avid hang glider. And over the weekend, he just decided, you know, to do his normal hang gliding. But yeah. well, up there, yeah. he cut an impromptu, like, I am scared to death of hang gliding. So first of all, like, I think I would be like, I don't even know if I could take my hand off that, uh, that handlebar you hold there. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, so the question, so does he, is he, was he hang gliding and he just normally has a camera and he was like bored and said, well, I got like 15 minutes to kill, let's do this. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's pretty much what was going on there. Um, amazing stuff, as you mentioned, you mentioned uh, F3 coming up, big, big in-person events. We're so excited to have you all back together. Actually, last week I got to fly again for the first time, not on a hang glider, an actual airplane, so I'm looking forward to getting you all down here to CHA, that's Chattanooga, November, uh, what is it, 8th to 10th? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, F3. eight is when it starts. F3. The uh, the uh, Bonnaroo of Freight. The Bonnaroo of Freight. It's going to be a huge festival. It's going to be multiple days. We have bands playing there. You can meet everybody you see here on TV, everybody, our journalists, plus everybody in the industry. It is going to be massive. But, hey, you know what? Hang gliding, pretty cool, but not an Olympic sport. Which is a shame. It really should be. Yeah. I think so. But we do have a quick story we're going to cover now oh. about a uh, about uh, diving, right? Diving, that's a sport that's in the Olympics. Diving and there is, is an Olympic a, uh, sport, yes. A Schneider truck driver whose daughter is in the Olympics now. We'll get to that story right after we tip the band. This episode is brought to you by Legend Transportation, which has been establishing partnerships for outstanding customer service since 2007. Learn more at newlegendinc.com. Now, we were going to have Todd Jay Nunn from Schneider, but apparently they, they couldn't connect or there was some reason. I don't know. Um, but let's talk about this. His, the, yeah, let's Schneider, do it. Schneider's rallying behind. Let's show a few pictures here. Schneider, show a few pictures here. Schneider's rallying behind this girl right here. Her name is uh, Krista. Her name is Krista Palmer. Krista Palmer. That's Mitch Palmer and Vicky. Mitch is a driver for Schneider. His daughter, she's been trying to qualify for the Olympics for a while, but actually not for too long. I found out that she, she's 29 now. She only started driving when she was 20. Right, so this isn't something she's she's only been, she started diving at twenty. Yeah, That's she did like gymnastics late before in life. She right? did gymnastics before yeah. and pivoted to the diving game. She's in the Olympics. Right. They've had their first event with her. Uh, it was a synchronized diving. It happened, right. I believe, yesterday or two days ago. It's a couple um, days ago, yeah. I don't believe she medaled in that event, but they still have what three more sessions coming up. So you'll be able to catch her Friday, July thirtieth. At 1 a.m. Central Time, uh, she's also Saturday, July 31st, and Sunday they'll be doing uh, the different springboard events, the three-meter springboard event. But really cool story. And Schneider is getting behind them, as you see there. They put those big uh, banners and posters out. Uh, they've been sharing real-time results with friends and family and their colleagues over there. Yeah. 
Yeah, and really getting behind him. We we caught up with this at, during the Olympic trials, right? Is when we we got wind of this. Yes, we did. Yeah, and they were showing the life behind where her parents. Her parents actually team. Well, they're not team drivers, but she travels with him, right? Yeah. How I got to tell you something though. I got to tell you, and they actually, you know what's pretty cool too, through these preliminaries and through all of her events, uh, Schneider has been routing Mitch and and uh, and his truck to where her events would be to make sure you had the right loads to bring there. So you can be a truck driver and have an Olympic daughter as well. Pretty amazing. However, I got to tell you. Someone raised the bar pretty high on this one. Who is the, in Alaska? Did you see that celebration? I did not see the actual celebration. So Lydia I, Jacoby, she, yeah. she's uh, her Alaskan hometown erupted. She's the first Alaskan, I believe, to win an Olympic gold. And yeah. they went wild. She won it in swimming. They were going crazy. So it was Team Schneider. If they get the gold, you're going to have to make a celebration video, and you're going to have to send it to us. But, hey, we wish you all the best. Yeah, absolutely. Go. Go, Krista. I hope she does well. I hope she does well. Hey, i got to ask you something real quick, too. So, yeah, please. Anthony Pettit from Truck Park. We were talking about that previous episode. We were talking about these uh, the pizza delivery car, right? Oh, the recumbent bike type of thing? Yeah, with the REV1. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, he, say, he said something really interesting to me, and it was that I still think it's decades away before people will be used to these. And... um. <laughs> My thought on that was, I feel like I'm already used to it. Like after seeing a video, like I'll see it going down the road, and and I wouldn't be shocked. It may be decades before people stop like laying down in front of it on the road and stuff like that to try and mess yeah. with it. But I think I, I think people will be used to it real quick. I think be, well, for a few reasons too. They're small. It doesn't look much bigger than a bicycle, yeah, so it's yeah. not like it's intimidating. It's not like it's really that scary. It's not it, a semi truck coming down your neighborhood autonomously to deliver a pizza. Yeah, that would take <laughs> that would take some time. And you know, humans with technology, it may seem like awesome and crazy but once we get it you know once we get vr once we go up to the self-checkout uh, at stop and shop when i was in boston yeah. we had robots growing around the store people take one look at it and they go okay this is uh what it is now yeah self-checkout took nothing cell phones psh, okay got cell phones now i'm into right. it yeah i'm into it i too. think pizza delivery robots could do really well here in chattanooga I think it could do really, really well for, yeah, I, I think they would. I think yeah. they really would. Although it does rain. It does rain a lot here. Well, we got well, Tim Leonard now. He's CEO of CST Transportation. So let's bring him on. He wants to talk about uh, something like data queue challenges or how to challenge data queue. And he also, apparently, he built a data warehouse for the NSA and the CIA. So, all right, let's stay on his good side. Tim, how are you doing today? <laughs> Nah, I won't, I won't spy on you guys too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, introduce yourself to our audience here in case they, yeah. they may not be familiar. No, nah, I appreciate it. Once again, guys, thanks for having me back again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you guys. You're, you're such professionals and quality of show is outstanding. So again, my name's Tim Leonard. Um, I'm the uh, CEO of CST uh, Trucking out of uh, Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, we do a lot of different things, not only just within refrigeration, uh, do a lot of poultry, a lot of uh, produce, but also do a lot of analytics, work a lot with freight waves on different programs. One of the programs that uh, we've done a lot of work on has been the Data Queue uh, analytics program, um, which is uh, kind of a streamlined program not a lot of people know about. Um, it enables kind of a, a hybrid of analytics um, that was designed to actually help small carriers to mid-sized carriers actually help them set up and design uh, out a program that, that challenges the crashing uh, that they may have actually been involved with, um, which is unique because uh, over 74% of carriers that are five trucks or less don't even submit a data queue challenge uh, that helps them uh, get, their, get it off their records, off their CSA scores. So it's a unique program. Um, we've been involved with it for about, uh, about 18 to 19 months, and uh, I think it's starting to streamline a lot quicker and a lot faster. It's just, it's not just built for the large carriers anymore. It's designed so that uh, small carriers, mid-sized carriers can actually help with uh, reduce their insurance costs and actually uh, lower a little bit of uh, the safety of their CSA scores. So Tim, talk about, talk about how uh, someone would have to go about finding this information to even know to challenge prior to data queue. Yeah. What was that process? Yeah, and that's like? great. Absolutely. So FMCSA has a great website that's out there. Um, you can actually go to uh, there about uh, the DQ process. If you type in fmcsa.dot.dot.gov, uh, do a search on data queue. It actually goes to a website area. You fill out, you know, kind of to an area about your DOT MCO numbers, and you actually design out. You know, uh, actually, it's got a great done. Uh, FMCSA did, has done a great job training people, illustrating people about how you do it. So, for example, there's eight categories of how to challenge a particular crash that's out there. There's only eight of them. Now, 
you know, there's other other ports about where you get hit in the side of the vehicles or, or different uh, situations. But FMCSA has done a great job so that if you're in, in the old days, you know, if you, as you guys well know, if you got in an accident, you know, in the vehicle, boy, you were hosed. I mean, you had no way of, you know, fighting this thing or challenging it. And, and you guys know better than I do that, you know, your insurance cost goes through the roof. So FMCSA has done a great job. They've designed a website that's out there. Um, again, it's all about what's called preventative determination program. So this program really lets you walk you through step by step about the eight categories. It enables you also to look at some great statistics. There's a thing around, you know, quarterly statistics that actually illustrates, you know, where the, the most of the accidents are occurring, how to uh, prevent those. But more importantly, how do you collect the right sites of data, the, the police reports, the video cameras? And then how do you go to submit this thing through the data, uh, data queue portal? that lets you uh, challenge this thing um, consistently. And then a great scorecard that we put together that we're starting to go ahead and release. So you can put your data inside the scorecard to actually measure your success against everybody else. Wow. So what kind of like, I'll be the audience member here because I've never used a data queue system. So I have no idea what the process or any of that stuff is. Thank you for giving us some insight there. What kind of analytics would help you with this process? So, for example, um, you know, the, the types of the, the driver themselves. So you can look at, you know, is there a consistency of a driver that, you know, uh, you know, is, is running into a particular problem, like let's say in the northeast. But more importantly, it, it collects the data about where the parts of the accidents are occurring. So, for example, you know, CST was involved with an accident about nine months ago. Beautiful cameras. And most people talk about, hey, you got to have cameras forward looking, backing side got to have a great safety program, uh, which we all have. That doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily get out of a crash or it's non-preventable. We had one where the lady struck a barrier, actually ran across three lanes, but because she hit the truck in the side or or where she had hit it, um, it was a non-preventable accident. Now, what could have helped us prepare for that was you know, making sure that we educate our drivers about situations, about collecting data on the scene itself you know, witnesses, other ass, other pieces of data that enforce the video or the police report. So it's more than just, you know, grabbing the police report or the videos. It's actually collecting uh, sets of data road conditions that helps the inspector or the person reviewing the data queue to actually collect all the data, review all the data, and actually get you off the hook for preventable accident. So, Tim, uh, people are listening and, and want to start using this. They're not using it. I can't believe they don't, they don't know about this. They really should be usually utilizing this to keep their, their records clean and challenge things. Where do they go to get training on this and really understand how, how to use this? For, right. Where do they go to get the alerts that they should challenge? And then how do they get the training to actually have the right information? Right. What information do they need? to challenge. Oh, yeah. And, and, and again, it goes out to, there's a, a uh, once, you, once you go up to the portal itself, there's a section called Crash Preventative Demonstration Program. In this program, they have what's called guides. There's an eligibility guide, a submitter guide, frequently asked questions, um, federal registration notices, which you just referred to about things in which data uh, points come out. So, again, this is one. I mean, FMCSA doesn't get enough credit uh, for some of the things that they do uh, do provide. This was a program I think they've done a great job on. Um, They have it out on their website underneath their DOT program. They have notices, you know, federal registration notices posted, for example, here in July. Uh, They had one that recently just came out about where legally stopped parked cars are unattended to. So you can actually download these CMSV files and actually get some of this data um, that you can go ahead and program into your TMSs or in your CSA safety uh, director training program. So your safety directors can actually help with the, uh, the specifics around training the drivers more effectively. So go out to the uh, FMCSA Preventative Demonstration Program on their website. They have tons of of manuals, tons of, but they do it nicely because they do it from a submitter perspective, as well as they show you from a reviewer perspective, which is critical. I think when you look at it, people quickly go into the data queue challenge. They're like, man, I'm in a hurry. I'm just going to challenge it. I've got my police report. You know, I've got my my, uh, you know, any video cameras I submit it, I go away right now. Sixty two percent of all the submissions are failing because they don't select the right category. 
So there's only eight categories in which you can go after. So don't be in a hurry. Follow the program. Look at the demonstration program. But more importantly, download some of the downloadable data, so, you know, the particular accidents that are occurring. You know, the, the places, are, for example, up in the northeast in which parking, you're going to get a lot of violations within the parking that you can actually make it preventable. So they're they're all there, which is amazing because I don't think people like you said, they actually go in and they download this data. Yeah, it's you know, in some ways, it's almost like a credit score, right? This is what it's sounding like yeah. to me here. How uh, how do you lower that, that? I guess that CSA score is what we're talking about there. How do you lower that like you would attempt to lower a, a credit score? Yeah, and as you guys know as well as I do, when you go in, you want you want to check a DOT. Let's say you're, Tim, I can you tell know, you how to lower a credit score. I can tell you how to lower a credit score pretty easily. <laughs> I'm at race. That's easy. <laughs> and, and again, it, it goes back to what you guys have said is, is, is people aren't even aware that a good program like this exists, but more importantly, that the data sets that are there that actually, uh, you know, crash preventions have, have increased by, by 23% in the last 90 days. I don't know if more drivers are on the road, you know, the hostilities about the COVID getting over with, but it just seems like it's a very hostile environment on the roadways today. So if you're not out there and you're not getting some of these data sets that this program provides to let it feed into your safety program, you're missing out big time. Yeah, that, I mean, that, and that's a great point, and it's kind of an iron underlying theme, although you've said it a couple times in here, and I, I think the point can't be made too many times is this is not only just a challenge, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of data in here that you can utilize in your safety program to guide that and shape that and really prevent these accidents, and then you don't have to challenge this stuff. But when they're challenging something, Tim, what, what, it, what is there? You said there's a reviewer there. What's the process there? Is it like I challenge and I know within the next 15 minutes whether I won or not, or what, what, how does that work? And that's actually, actually that's a great question. I, I think you, the, you know, the the guideline says within ten days they're going to get back to you in terms of once you submit it. You know, you have a set standard if you follow the process where you've submitted your descriptive narrative about what happened. You've added the police report. You've added maybe a video camera to illustrate what it is. You've done your homework and you've put it under the right category of the eight. Um, they typically have about 10 days in which they respond. Now, during the COVID time, you know, it, it, it was longer than that. I'll be honest with you. I've been keeping track of it now for about a year. Um, but now it's gotten better. It's gotten quicker. But you should expect something back within 10 days. And now listen here, make no doubt about it. You, right now, the failure rate is close to 15 to 30 percent just off that first submission. Either people didn't describe it right. They picked the wrong category. So you can resubmit again off the same one. So you, you've got to make sure that as you're going through this process is that one, you're following what process lays down, you're selecting the right category, but just because you failed the first time doesn't mean you can't resubmit it again with their feedback. So they provide constructive feedback about why I'm failing this. And here's the reason why, A, you selected mm. the wrong category, B, hey, listen, you said in your report that the person was, uh, you know, uh, you know, had alcohol. Well, it doesn't meet the, the requirements within the alcohol level. And did you did you actually um, get the right police report to support that? So you got to do your homework. Most of these guys just like I said, they'll try to do it in five minutes and say, yeah, I, I submitted a DQ challenge. And it's like a court case. It's no different than you're going to defend your rights as a carrier. You're there to defend your rights. This program was designed to help defend your rights. So in the past, it was an all or nothing. You guys remember the days where you, you got a little bump on there, automatically the driver was blamed. Oh, yeah. Driver got hit in the rear 15 years ago, they were blamed. This program, now it's not perfect by all means, but have your analytics ready to go that covers preventable things, mm -hmm. what you did to prevent this, any safety information you wanna provide. But more importantly is that, and again, I can't highlight this or stress this enough, Make sure you pick the right category. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Tim, thanks for this. Thanks for this education yeah. on uh, on data queue. Next time, come back and talk to me about cross border. That's what I know a lot about. He knows about the uh, the data queue stuff. Next time, we'll do some cross border <laughs> with you, Timmy. Uh, where do people go to learn some more information, though? Yeah, we're we're putting out some more stuff under our uh, you know CST website. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and submit one of a paper over to uh, Freightways about the uh -huh. analytics. There is a star Tim, scheme I, I, of that. We, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, what's the website they should go to? Um, it's it's a Kerrigan and Sons Trucking .com, Thank you and, very much. Uh, we'll have the, the white paper out there, and plus uh, over to Freightways. 
Thank, thank Excellent. you. We appreciate it. Thanks for your time Thanks, today. Tim. Take it easy. All right, great. Now we're going to go over to Robert Moffitt, EVP and Director of Operations over at New Legend, Inc. Robert, how are you doing today? Thanks for coming back on the show. How are we guys doing today? Yeah, I, well, we, we don't want to date you. You know, we don't want to carbon date you, but we know that you've been around for <laughs> maybe 30, you know, 30 years or so in this business. And through that time, you've seen a lot of evolution of freight tech. You know, a lot of that, a lot of that evolution was just a fax machine for years. And, and maybe, uh, what, what do they call that? Those sheets of paper with the perforated edges on the side? Remember um, those machines? <laughs> I remember the dot matrix printers. <laughs> dot matrix, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. How, let, how, let's talk about how technology has changed between, um, between then and now and how New Legend Inc. is embracing it. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I'll go back to the comment. Crayons, paper, and uh, the phone at the truck stop, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's exactly right. So, so where are we at today? <laughs> uh, that's, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting analogy. Um, today, I think we're still using crayons and paper and uh, phones, but I think we're using it in a technology world that allows us to put a lot of infrastructure into things that we're doing inside the office, outside the office, and into the truck. And it, it basically goes all the way back to the customer. So with all those infrastructures that are out there, everybody has to interface, and everybody's got a solution for everything, right? So yeah, you've got to be able to match that stuff up. And with the interface pieces that are out there, you've got to be able to harness the right type of technology so that you can communicate that piece. I think that's where we're at today. I think that's really the key, too. Wouldn't you say, Robert, is, is knowing which pieces or which types of technology to marry together and how to get them together to have the end result rather than just, hey, I've got a problem, technology? Um, yeah, you do have to have an understanding. You, you've got to truly have an understanding of how it's all going to piece together. Because there's so many different pieces that come together. Certain shippers use certain types of uh, integration. Uh, we use certain integration. And then it all runs through the same pieces. And we've got it all make, make it work so that there's two communication. Well, talk about making it work then. So you, you're going through your own tech evolution over there. How have you integrated these systems? Let's get a little bit more specific here. Okay, so we use McLeod as an integration piece for our TMS. Inside of that, um, currently, there's 11 interfaces that help us do our job. Um, each one of those are um, from other corporations that have worked into McLeod that allow us to do our stuff, which is the EDI piece, the fuel piece, um, or we'll call it breakthrough fuels, another piece that we use for the accounting piece. We have to go back out to different banks that we have to th use through um, our accounting department that has to have three different strands because each one of them has a different way of working. And then you've got the TMSs on the other side. Um, I'll, I'll, in the context, of, we'll use a JDA, we'll use Blue J, we'll use a couple of, I mean, those are truly some of the pieces that are out there that all have to integrate together and talk. And each one of those has those pieces on top of it that have to be able to communicate to Armor Cloud and we have to be able to communicate back. And those are the true harnessing pieces of technology. Wow, so the, all the technology changes through over, throughout the years. Uh, we can talk about all the advancements and the positive that has happened. What have you seen as some of the drawbacks? Uh, you know, for me, 14 years ago, I remember walking on a dock and the computers were down. Nobody was working. I'm like, uh, here's the bill of ladings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that door over there says where it's going. Let's start moving some freight. Uh, what are the drawbacks that you see in, in the advancements of technology, whether through mistakes in accepting it or, or utilization or, or what have you? Um, I think in the utilization of um, where we're at today, I think it really manages the analytics piece of time management and uh, man hours that take to do the job uh, from the standpoint of um, it's getting onto the truck. So I think the shippers are using that the, those pieces to make sure that they're managing their labor time that's in their warehouses and then putting it back on our truck and then the, setting the expectation for the, our drivers to deliver the product to the stores. So hopefully that, that chain is getting smaller. And we're not going to call it GIT, but I think we're getting that chain smaller to where people are getting their product when they need to have it. Um, and I think part of that process with that technology piece is I saw something yesterday where there's a lot of stuff that's supposed to get into the supply chain, but it's not here. 
so there's less product on the shelf. So how to how do we meet the demand of the customer that's here by making sure that product gets to the store quick enough to keep the shelf full? I think that's part of the process we're in today in the, the what we have with uh, COVID, and that's coming out of it and finding out how we're going to get it get it there as quick as we possibly can once it hits the ground. Freight tech, rapidly changing landscape. Companies come and go. They merge. Big deals, big investment deals, all these kind of things. So how does someone like you, where you're sitting, how do you determine which tech is right for New Legend? So some of the stuff that we use, we have to use because the customer uses it. So we have to be able to brand our stuff and make it talk to each other. I mean, there's so many different pieces that are out there that, you know, the scripts that are written inside the system to make things work like it's supposed to. One piece may be one way and another one may be another way. And the difference is something in the script that tells it to do something differently. It's, it's, it's very unique with technology because if I'm using one piece of technology and the customer is using another piece of technology, but their, their WMS system is different in the, in the warehouse, it all has to tie together somewhere, but it still ends up coming back to us so we can make sure that we make the shipment to the customer. That's so it all a, has to, the data all has to flow in all directions. Right. I was going to say that's such an excellent point, too. And a lot of times it gets glossed over in this talk that a lot of times carriers, brokers, you're limited or the, the, the growth of your freight tech a lot of times is determined by the needs of your customers. So you may want this, you may want that. But if it doesn't integrate with your customer needs, it doesn't matter. And a lot of times you have to bring on maybe more solutions. You're double, triple redundant just to keep just to match up with your customer needs right now. It, it would be great to see that cycle evolve a little bit. Right. So there are more universal solutions. Um, I just don't think that you're going to find one solution that's yeah. going to be able to make everything work because that would be a monopoly. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a that's a solid point, point. but it, it just goes to show, you know, it, it, bringing on the wrong te tech can actually uh, be uh, an adverse uh, reaction. You can have adverse sure. Im impacts into your into your company, obviously. To to your point, like a so, really bad hire, like a yeah, like a, like really, a really, really bad, bad hire. executive hire. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you've got to study and know exactly what's there, but also stay on a, on the forefront before you get left behind. But so where where is tech going, uh, Robert? Where do you see this going? How do you, how do we get this integration? Is it more and more in the integration models that maybe aren't a monopoly? I mean, wh where do you see this heading? So I'm not really sure where it's going to head in the next five years because I really don't think there's a total solution that's out there. But I'm sure that once everybody understands where they're going, um, that there's probably going to be multiple people coming in with the same product and saying this is what they can do. And everybody's going to pick the best solution. I think that's probably where we're at. Um, I would say that from a standpoint of the technology piece that we're all trying to get to, it, we'd like to make it seamless. But everybody has their challenges, and that's where technology really comes in, where we're going to have um, <clears throat> some changes in the future, but I'm not really, I mean, I'm on the cusp of some of the things because we hear about them, but then you find out that they're not going to move forward with that. And then they go back because it didn't work like it was prescribed. So you've got the people that come up and say, this is going to work, we're going to work, going to work. They've put four or five years of uh, uh, data analytics into it, tried to make it work. And when it comes down to it, it doesn't integrate enough with everybody. So it's feasible for everybody to use it. Hey, Robert, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to the next time we'll be seeing you. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks, take, guys. Take it easy. Thanks, Robert. Again, we'd like to thank Robert and our friends at Legend Transportation for sponsoring today's episode. Legend partners with strategic customers while providing seamless solutions for its drivers and is West Regional's premier freight transportation company. Learn more at, tell them, dude. Hey, go to newlegendinc.com. Right after the show. All right. May the Rick Schwartz be with you. He's the VP of <laughs> Engineering and Corporate Optimization over at SD's Express Line. I couldn't wait for him to come on just to uh, bring up that Spaceballs reference. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, Rich, this is going to be a good one because you and Michael Vincent have actually, you and the dude have actually walked some of the same pathways. The we same, may have pounded they, the same docks, yeah, tell man. Tell about that. Yeah, so, so roadway 93 through 99. I was roadway 88 through uh, 99 my, myself. A uh, little district 14, 15 myself. I don't know where you were at. Oh, we might have been the same there, but I was uh, Minneapolis, district 15. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah, I was uh, Toledo and then over into, into Akron and in Pennsylvania. So, 
So both of you guys have this amazing LTL experience, right? You, you, a ton of experience. And you all know that one of the biggest problems at LTL, and you were telling me this story about how you used to do L- inventory tracking, and it was, yeah. it was this really like rudimentary yeah. system, yeah. right? It was like the most basic of Excel inventory trackers where like it was almost binary. Like there's, there's you know, you add or, or subtract uh, each time a, a dolly comes in, right? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Well, well, you're you're yeah. trying to solve this huge issue that's been in LTL for a long time, and you partnered up with Spirion to do it. So tell us about what this is and how it's going to help LTL and equipment tracking and all that. Tell us about the partnership. Yeah, you bet. Well, it's been an ongoing uh, discussion for probably the last two years. I remember when they first came in and presented to us, uh, you look at trailer tracking and go, well, that's a, that's a truckload solution. That, that doesn't fit into the LTL space, right? Uh, but hey, I reflect back my old roadway days. Uh, one of my first jobs was putting all the trailers on the clipboard and walking the yard and checking them all off and doing the uh, asset inventory. But uh, you know, we've talked with Sprint for a couple of years, and they really, um, they're really they a good partner for us. They stayed patient, challenged them to find ROI in the LTL space. And, and the more we discussed it, the more the opportunities started to rise in our operations. From a yard check, uh, you talk about trailer detention sitting at your customers, uh, drivers coming in and can't find their trailers in the yard, drivers going to the BNSF and can't find a trailer in the rail yard, or, or drivers going to a large FC that has 300 trailers and they're, and they're driving around for 45 minutes. So in our business, minutes, minutes matter at our, at our size. We have a lot of drivers in the network. So this allows us to bring this technology and really enhance some of the tools we already have in place. It just makes them better. Yeah, it, it, it really does. It's amazing the different things that were done. The, the problem that this is solving is, is so huge. You mentioned with the clipboard, and I imagine in Minneapolis you learned really quickly how to hit that, that latch on the back of a trailer to listen for the echo. That, that was the trick, Dooner, yeah, in right. the winter, to go out there and hit that latch just at the right angle and listen for the echo to see if it was empty or not. So you didn't oh. have to open up all those thousands of doors out there. tuning for yeah, it's exactly like a, like a tuning for you. Listen for that right pitch, whether it was that's a right. pup or, or, or 48. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. But this goes beyond just um, – it goes beyond just that, that knowing what assets you have in your pool and what is, what is there, right? I mean, this goes to, this goes to, my, uh, to, to maintenance and to, to, to asset utilization and distribution throughout the networks, et cetera. Can you talk to some of those – problems that that exist in LTL for the, the truckload people out there that don't understand uh, this type of thing? Yeah, so, well, you look at asset utilization, right, with a fleet our size, if we can improve utilization by 1%, uh, that's a big number. You're talking about saving, maybe purchasing three or 400 trailers that uh, the prices keep going up on. You're talking about $15 million of CapEx saving per year. Uh, you look at how are your assets being utilized in your operation? You know, the one common denominator in LTL is use a trailer in each, each facet of your operation, line hall, city, or dock. So you're always looking, how do you, how do you improve the utilization in each one of those segments? Uh, take a P&D operation. You have trailers spotted all over the city at your customers. You, you think you know where they're all at, but I would challenge any carrier to really, you know, do you know 100% with, with 100% accuracy where all your equipment's at? Or where we have customers that require a large amount of trailers to pick up every day. And requiring us to spot five or ten trailers, but they really only use, really only need three. So what's going to allow us to do on the asset side is almost custom fit trailer pulls to the terminal's book of business, right? Whether they're a heavy they have a heavy trailer use customers, either spotted on the inbound side or the outbound side, or are they more of an LTL, you know, stop here, stop there. Where they, they need less trailers than the, than the heavier uh, stations with uh, a lot of spot equipment. So We'll be able to custom fit. You know, we have over 200 facilities, so we see some synergies just custom fitting these trailer pulls, and um, really being able to, instead of having a cookie cutter, open up a new terminal. Hey, I need this many trailers and this many dollies. We'll be able to really get uh, real specific on the fleet side. Um, you know, using GPS miles to schedule PMs and see what equipment has, what assets are being used the most. It was pretty valuable for our folks. Uh, you know, this FL Flex device that we we're putting on the trailers, it's it's a it's like a hub. It's very modular, so we can plug sensors in in the future. And, and I know my fleet guys have already pinged me about plugging PSI in and monitoring tire pressure and, and getting some analytics around uh, tire wear. Wow. So, so when we, you mention the see- sensors, when you mention the sensors here, uh, what what are they, and what are the different things that they can they can track? And you just talked about how they're expanding into other things, but what are the what do the sensors look like? And um, yeah, give us some insight. 
Yeah, so we're putting on the uh, two types right now. We have a container pole, which we're putting solar uh, sensors on. It called the Solar Flex. So obviously you don't have any power to recharge the lithium battery, so we're using the solar to keep the batteries charged. Uh, on our on our trailers and dollies, what we're doing is we're we're tying into the seven way power. So when a driver hooks up to it, it'll it'll power up the device. Uh, but it also the device uh, has an accelerometer built into it. So when you don't have power and you're in a yard operation, and that trailer gets moved by a jockey, well, guess what? If you're only going to read the power, you only know the last GPS location where it was last powered up. With the accelerometer, it wakes up the device. When it senses movement, and then when it when the movement stops, it'll record a new GPS location. So, from a yard application standpoint, for our yard our yard ops, it's be a huge benefit. Oh yeah, you don't have to. You know exactly how many parking spaces, how many trailer spaces you have there, what doors these things are in, all physical, and you don't have to worry about the person typing in the wrong thing. I guess safety would be a, another uh, big aspect of this, would it not? I mean, you've got the P and D units and limited use units that you've got to prove for safety reasons as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this allows us to tie, you know, a lot of our uh, current technologies together, right? Bringing the fleet, the ops, the safety side, um, you know, the annual recertifications we need to have done on our equipment. Uh, it allows us to look at uh, demand in different markets and be able to move trailers proactively across the country. Right now, we're able to we're also able to establish some capacity, trailer capacity in our yards. So as we start approaching capacity, we can start getting alerts saying, hey, you have this many trailers in this geofence. We hit this certain amount. You know, we need to take some action because we might be in gridlock in the next week or so. So you started this partnership a little over a month ago, right? So you not a long time to collect data or see it out in the wild, but a little bit of time. So, so far, what have the, what's the uh, reception been to it? What's the response been internally and externally? Yeah, so we, we started putting the uh, devices on equipment back in January and, and actually partnered with Spuria. And we have 22 sites set up across our network where they have installers right on site working with our teams. So some of the data we're seeing now is, you know, we went in and geofenced all our terminal locations, all the rail locations. We've actually geofenced some customers to, ten, to test some detention to see when it comes into geofence and when it leaves and, and really get a little more detail on you know, how long are our trailers sitting out at our customer locations. So we, we probably were over halfway home. We have about 23,000 assets tagged right now. We have a goal to be done by the end of the year, get to like 42,000. Mm, wow. wow. I, I wow. like that you have that data too. So you don't have to have those. I mean, this used to happen in transportation all the time. He said, she said, Hey, my trailers are, you know, there's like my therapist always says, don't use the absolutes. Always don't use, you know, you always do this. And you, you know, you call right. up the shipper. You always keep my containers held up forever. Oh no, we don't. You know, we get you. Well, then you have data. You go, well, you actually are holding it up. <laughs> Everything that goes this. in there is eight plus hours. And this is why we're either, you know, changing how much you are paying or we're not serving you at all. I mean, at least you have that argument to back you up. Right. Yeah, you have that, you have that argument as well. <laughs> well, the one thing that always happened is terminal managers would hoard trailers, right? Yeah. I mean, no, you just leave it off. Leave those couple few empties off of you the yard report. I don't know whenever because you need That's those right. for your for your favorite customers, right? So you have those. But uh, to that point, though, um, Rick, have you, have you seen um, any any unexpected results so far? Have you any said, wow, we didn't expect to see that? Uh, I wouldn't say so much unexpected. I think I've seen when I looked at the data, maybe more idle equipment that I'd like to see. Yeah. And uh, I see more equipment getting used inside of our terminal operations, not necessarily in line hall, city P&D or, or in the yard. So uh, the industry sent, tends to see a lot of appointment freight nowadays. And, and I see a lot of those trailers being tied up in that appointment trap type freight. Did you find it? Did you, did you catch the guy who keeps hiding all the dollies? <laughs> No, we'll find some dispatchers hiding uh, trailers in the P and D uh, operation. <laughs> oh yeah, you're glad you're Absolutely. not alive during that era, man. You get you would have got. I'd have got caught. Well, it was easier to play the games back then, right? It was a lot, e- right. a lot easier. Look, LTL, a lot of moving parts. A lot of you know. You talk about the supply chain itself. They say on average, sixteen different intermediaries have to touch something. But then you bring in LTL, where yeah. you're talking about all these different moving parts that are not just equipment, not just your own freight, and other shippers' freight, and going to different consoles and moving to different. It's it's a tough. So visibility there, highly highly important. This is really really cool. How do people? Where do people go to learn more information about it? Well, uh, obviously, uh, 
Spirion has been a great partner for us, and, and they have a lot of solutions out there. Um, we're going to continue to deploy our technology and, and look at additional technology that allows us to keep moving forward, improve the quality of our product, and, and give our folks tools they can use that are, that are good for them every day to be more effective. Excellent. Hey, thanks for joining us. Go check out uh, SC's Express Lines and Spirion. Good times. So we have uh, dipped our toe in the water of this multiple times. We've taught, we touched base with Bill Driegert on it. We talked about it a week or two ago on the show, and it was the big partnership, right? With yeah. Blue Grace, Uber Freight, another LTL segment coming at you right now. I hope you like LTL because we got Andy Burke. He is the Senior Director of Sales over at Blue Grace Logistics today. He's going to share some insight into that partnership. And uh, hey, man, dig the background. Thanks, guys. I'm glad to be here and <laughs> happy to continue the conversation about LTL. Well, and you know, <laughs> hey, you're, you're, overloaded today. you're coming into uh, at least half friendly territory because half of this desk is a vegetarian over here. And I, I've heard you're a vegan as well. So I'm going to give you a little cowbell. No. <laughs> Let's get into this, man. Tell us a little bit about Blue Grace expertise in the LTL marketplace and how it led to this deal with Uber Freight. Well, you know, we, we started out really with our roots in LTL, and over 12 years, we've, we've been a market leader, um, really driving innovation uh, with BlueShip, which is our proprietary native tech that runs, you know, rating, customer interfaces, um, you know, and, and provides uh, all of the transparency uh, to both carriers and customers. Um, I th think that, you know, we, we were running a, a play that wanted to kind of replace the old technology, the old infrastructure that had no transparency and no, no scalability in the market uh, for LTL uh, for shippers. And it appear, apparently Uber was doing something similar. So it was a natural fit and it really worked for them to avoid taking the bruises um, and the time that it takes to get up the learning curve in what re you guys know is a completely different market than truckload. So where they have all the connections and uh, the, the processes for, for truckload, we have those down and, you know, have evolved those over 12 years on the LTL side. So, Andy, so, hey, welcome to, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for being on, my friend. Uh, let, let's talk about the, the selection and what, what are the benefits? Really, what is Uber getting out of this by, by having a, a, a Blue Grace? They, they, they could go and pick from a, a number of different intermediaries in the LTL and TMSs, et cetera. But Blue Grace is the exclusive partner in this. Why did they select you guys? What's the benefit to them for gumming with, with Blue Grace? Yeah, so... so um, there are, you know, only so many companies that can stand up to Uber's requirements and serve customers of all size. Obviously, we have to be a top performing organization to be in the ball game. Uh, we self-servicing capabilities were important, reporting, data analytics, open connectivity, and the expertise and availability to meet clients of all sizes with um, whatever uh, interfaces they need. And we, we've got really the, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of options for them. Yeah, we were talking to Bill Driegert about this on uh, on Monday, right? Yeah. And I was yeah. comparing it to a basketball team and how Uber is starting to make all these moves all of a sudden. And it actually it reminded me of the Celtics when they when they lost out on drafting uh, LeBron, right? They had a they did that big trade for Kevin Durant, and then very slowly, oh, they're putting all these different pieces together. Yeah. And we're seeing Uber Freight assemble that. Now you're part of the team, but where does Uber Freight fit for Blue Grace? Like, why was it important for you to have this partnership, and how does it enhance what you do? Well, I, I think it was kind of a, a natural because our technology and our, our uh, ramp to innovate that technology and stay on the forefront uh, is, is very a parallel path in what, what Uber was taking. And so as we started talking, uh, it seemed like a, you know, a, a real easy plug-in uh, because all of the resources that they have, they didn't need to Hire. They didn't need to build. Uh, there was a lot that that they could skip over and go right to market with the best in class uh, offering. And so, uh, the more we talked, the more we liked each other, and it it really made sense to you know to put our toe in the water. And the initial testing went really well, and and now we're ready to really roll out. That's excellent. So, Andy, outside of the tech, what is uh, what are the other advantages for this partner partnership both ways? Yeah, so um, I, although Blue Grace is really known for its tech um, and the ability to customize solutions for you know for shippers, 
um, there, there's really an army behind that, uh, right? So there, there's asset and non-asset experts from the industry. That's how that's a kind of our secret sauce of how we grew. It's really the people, uh, the, the folks that, that came into and became part of Blue Grace and contribute. Um, what we've developed is a very unique supply chain engineering approach. It's a consulting approach where, uh, you know, companies hire us. They just don't pay us. And so we, we engage with them. We analyze their footprint, figure out everything that they're doing. And in, in, in with our experience of hundreds of other you know, supply chains, we're, we're able to really bring that experience to bear. And when, uh, when they implement, um, that's when they get to realize the savings. And they don't have to worry about investing in a TMS that they're only going to use you know, 10, 30% of. They're not going to have to hire the people and that are specialized in it and try to get their data in it and try to keep up and iterate every two or three years as the market uh, drives and, and, and changes. So we do all that for them. Um, our expertise go, coming from LTL, we expanded um, into truckload where now we, we have a market leading uh, offering there. And that led right into managed logistics where we have hundreds of customers that uh, ask us to uh, handle all of their logistics uh, requ requirements and services. Um, and so it's been really nice because uh, these supply chain engineers are in the background, right? So they do all the mapping, the analytics, the, uh, the operational flow um, so that we know and a customer knows before they engage with us what to expect as an outcome. Right. So it's not just, oh, I hope we get two percent better savings. Um, it's really something where their, you know, CEOs, their executive suite can make better business decisions based on the data that we drive because it's their KPIs. It's their um, their numbers that they're, we're trying to dig out for them and help them to improve. So every industry is a little bit different. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're always hyper focused on CPG retail and manufacturing um, but we we expand in you know we're expanding into other industries and expanding our footprint geographically across the country yeah I, uh, I new offices that. in Detroit and Phoenix I, I love that managed transportation space oh yeah and, absolutely you know, I, I can see why you're talking about it here why uber freight got into it with uh with with, with, with transplace and um, I used to work in that space as well it was great because you could you could take a much higher view of someone's supply chain when they give it to you like yeah. that, and you can deliver so many great savings by by just getting inside their lanes I don't oh, know yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. the value add is much greater and it's much more interesting it is and it's always easier to take that consultative yeah. approach to yeah, and work absolutely. With, with people that way well how can others tap into blue grace LTL tech and service network Andy well, you know, it really starts from top down, right? So when the leadership of a company has an interest in really uh, getting a sense of what's out there, what their competitors are doing, how they can be a market leader on a, from a supply chain front, then they can engage with us. Uh, we, we, you know, do an analysis and really it's, it's something that using their data, we'll put it into our model uh, with, you know, all the experience we have, we'll give them great feedback and, and then they can get an understanding of if we're able to help them. And probably 80% of the time, we're able to find distinct advantages. The way that they can engage is uh, go to mybluegrace.com. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can connect through the site with us. And we're, you know, we're staffed and ready uh, to really bring our expertise, just like we have with Uber, um, out to direct shippers and other logistics um, uh, logistics companies alike. Andy. Excellent. Andy, thank you so much. Uh, before I let you go, any advice for a relapsed vegetarian? So I'm a vegetarian. I've tried to do the vegan thing. <laughs> uh, the cheese, it calls to me like a siren to the rocks. What can I do? Ah, <laughs> uh, geez. I, you know, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but I, you know, I'm not no longer vegan. I'm vegetarian. So oh, tough, isn't it? Well, he you fell know. off the wagon too. Uh, we'll start a support <laughs> group. You and I will get back. Jeez. <laughs> hey. I, I don't know how you how you say no to really good pizza. <laughs> so tough, it's so tough, especially when it's delivered by a robot. Thank you so much for your time today, Andy. We appreciate it. All right, See, thanks, gentlemen.
Aviation. <laughs> <laughs> you fell off the wagon too. Sorry about that. Uh, I thought I was going to get you some really good help. I thought friend. I was too, but it's <laughs> like he said, it's hard. You see pizza after a while, you can't do it. You Somebody's, just got to have it, man. No, it's tough too, like diet stacking. So like you take vegetarian, you try to do keto or you do or you, you, uh, veganism, you try to do yeah. keto. I try, it's it's yeah. tough, man. Tough willpower is the only way to go. It, it's a very hard thing, man. All right, let's go inside the newsletter. Ooh. You can get the weather truck newsletter yourself in your inbox every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Just go to FreightWaves.com slash WTT to subscribe. You know, we're closing in on 4,000 subscribers now. Not that, not is that bad. Right? Yeah, it's only wow. been out for about, what, seven months now? So. Sweet. Not terrible, right? What do you nah, guys think? Not better terrible. Better sharp stick in the eye. Let me ask you a question. What is the flatbed rate per mile right now? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just throw me a number. <laughs> Twenty two dollars and eighty something. Three three dollars and ninety seven cents. Anyway, it's too much. Let's take a look at this video. My wife was driving through uh, <laughs> Massachusetts on four ninety five. <laughs> she's she's still out there. She's seen her side of the family, and she came across this right here, right there on the back go. of the flatbed. There you go. <laughs> People were criticizing. Stocking up for the Christmas rush, right there. <laughs> my buddies on my buddies on trucking Twitter. They weren't criticizing the the truck being used on a flatbed. Yeah. They were criticizing the strapping that they had done. Oh, uh, they're saying just right? two on the sides. They should have had a front and a back and a rear strap well, on a yeah. truck. You no, never no. know when that could just slide up and then oh, yeah. across the freeway like a roller skate. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. That, that's that's uh, what the truck. What the what the little truck? What the little truck is that? Back to school. <laughs> I don't know if you got your list, Mike. My, my six year old uh, school finally sent theirs. They need X amount of things. Well, think about this right now. Let's take a pic. Let's take a look at this picture. School supplies and short supply over here. Here's all things yeah, adding up to this. make. There's a lot more this. going on, but that's that's yeah. basically the gist of it, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You've all got this it. You've got it nailed down. But there's one other thing going on. Now you can put the bullwhip current through here as well, because yeah. what happened last year? Lockdown. Everyone sent home from school. Nobody went to school. We bought sweat they stayed pants. Home. Bought track pants. That's you didn't right. buy your kids maybe a new pair of sneakers. That's right. And I'm looking at my school list too, and they, they actually want clothes. Like I need an extra pair of boots, extra nerd. They, you need sure. some bogs. You need a jacket, but not a Columbia jacket for some reason. <laughs> yeah, you need the anti-Columbia supplies. jacket. Well, but what happened here is now everybody is waiting for. The, and, and look, only f- according to the National Retail Federation, they just put out this report, right? According to them, only 35% of uh, parents, right, K-12 through parents, have bought all their school supplies. Well, 74, 76%, I'm sorry, are still waiting on those list of needs from suppliers. So now we're entering in August, and we're coming into an environment where demand planners have to forecast for all of these people who didn't buy much of anything last year, except for, like, laptops and tablets yeah, and, and, yeah, uh, that's right. you know, and desks to work on, to get pencils, books, uh, pants to wear back to school, pants that aren't elastic, sneakers, all those kind of things. And are stylish. You get that bull would come in. It's the other thing, right? Exactly, exactly. So you, it, and it's like, it's like the couch thing, right? It yeah. may take your couch four months to arrive. You can go and get a couch. We're not saying couches are gone off the face of the earth. No. We're saying it's the couch you want it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's exactly right. So you can't you can't order pants for your kids going to school this year, and then they, they show up in the spring. They're not cool anymore. But we always go visibility, <laughs> visibility planning, right. demand planning, forecasting will yeah. fix everything. But how? How? Like for example, in fashion, well, how can it fix exactly what all these students are going to want when they come back? You could in, you can go back in time. You could input this data, but. How do you know in advance? And here's the problem. There's tons of inventory sitting around taking up warehouses with SKUs that will not move and will not sell. Now, you try to get out of the just in time, but you also, when you know supply chain, you realize why it goes. Because if you're Nike, right, and you send X amount of sneakers, they all sell out, no big deal. Maybe they become a collector's item. You don't send, you know, you send too many, then that's a problem. Yeah, exactly. I mean, people, there's much more, what, almost 10% increase in spending this year for school supplies and stuff, something like that? Record spending. Record spending this year. It's like 59, it's a lot. Eight, almost a 900, 850 bucks or something like that. Yeah, the average family, the average family was going to spend uh, 800 and eight, the average family this year will be spending $848.90. Oh, okay, so predi- what are they spending that's that on? 59 right? more than last year. That is, that is in total, that's uh, $3.3 billion more than last year. And last year, remember, you had to buy a lot of computers and everything as well. The numbers are even bigger when you go back two years. Yeah, and, and, yeah. It's uh, and so you've got all these suppliers and vendors trying to figure out exactly what is that increase going to be. Yeah. Right? And that is what you're saying. Laptops and computers went through. Probably not going to be those, but could be. And what I'm also saying is when you get your list of school supplies, make sure you're one of the first in lines over at your Walmart, Target, well, wherever you go. You're also saying 76% of the K-12s haven't gotten they their list yet? Got, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they haven't gotten it yet. Sales are going to be way up. Here's my demand planning for you, the consumer, you, the parent. Get out there and get your stuff as soon as you know what you need, right? Yeah. yeah. Gonna be, I mean, if you're a demand planner, how do you solve that with, with, with some software? You, you, you don't. 
I, I don't know. Some uh, aspects of it you can. Some aspects of it you can. I guess that's why there's experts out there and in, in, in alliances and federations that track all these trends. And so yeah. Right? Well, so. hey, you know what? You know what? Uh, gas prices, they've been expensive. You don't like paying for them. They have. Some I don't like paying for them, no. Have been added gas. I want to go electric. <laughs> I want to go electric soon. But one of the most annoying things are the ads that play when you are pumping your gas, right? Yeah, no doubt about it. Absolutely. So I came across this Reddit post right here, and this Redditor says that um, at the gas pump, someone had done a nice enough job of telling you the the hack, the button you can press on the gas pump to silence it. So my buddy, Aaron Dunn, who's with uh, Trucking for Millennials podcast, he works at PDQ America, he actually went out in the field and gave it a try. Let's take a look. Boom. Sweet. Silent. <laughs> Sweet silence. I love it. I'm a huge fan of it. What, That's what do you, awesome. How do you feel about these ads, by the way? Do you think so? Like, there was some person on Reddit, they had this dystopian thing where they're like, yeah, every five gallons, you're going to have to, you know, it's like a YouTube video. You got to oh. skip, you got to skip ad. You think maybe gas stations could sell like gas plus and you get like the no ad version. But if you go with the ads, maybe it's, I don't know, cheaper. But you got to skip that ad every or, or, or maybe like there's certain download for music downloads where you earn coins, virtual coins for looking at the ads, right? So you yeah. earn gas credits for watching the actual watching the ads. Well, it's better than nothing, right? It's better than nothing. I yeah. just wish they could somehow, if I use my phone to pay, like Apple Pay or something, yeah, then they could tailor the ads to what I normally look up. Yeah, uh, someone brought up someone also in the Reddit comments. They That'd brought up an argument that. Um, that can be dangerous as well. They're they're not in the sure. best area. They have to fill their gas at night. It limits their their ability to hear their surroundings and what's going on around them. I don't yeah. know. What do you guys feel? Sound off. Sound off. Comment. Tell us what you feel about gas station ads. All right. All right. We'll leave you with this one. Okay. And actually, this happened over in Braintree, not too far where I'm from. So, let's take a look at this picture here. How do you think that happened? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody We're looking got, at it as a truck. Well, that, I think the Yankee fan was being chased by some uh, Red Sox. Yeah, fans. well, Commonwealth Utilities truck over here. It goes into this newly renovated house over on River Street in Braintree, Massachusetts. Rolling off street crashes right through that front panel there. Wow. Um, neighbor doesn't hear it. That, like, the, 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 that family's not home, thankfully. Neighbor hears it, runs over. He's like, oh, my gosh, what happened? You know, <laughs> He opens the door of the truck and looks inside. You know who's sitting there? No. Two chocolate laps <laughs> and no driver. <laughs> no driver. And no driver. He said you could only surmise that the two dogs were in the front. Maybe, maybe something got released. They went for a ride. That's probably the best you can come up with. But is it? What if? What if? The Ooh. truck crashes, right? Yeah. He's a driver. He's got two dogs. The truck crashes. He jumps out. And he off. jumps out. You know, no one's home in the house. He runs through the house. He goes out through the other door when nobody's looking. That and he blames it on the dogs. That's immediately what came to my mind is this guy just set the whole thing up. He, I, well, in some right? Yeah. Because where's that driver afterwards? No, it's perfect. That's it, the plot hole. That's the missing plot hole in this story. And that's yeah. what the neighbor didn't, uh, Glenn Fillmore, that's what he didn't understand when he's talking to the Patriot Ledger. But maybe now that he's some, had some more time to process this, he, he gets it. Yeah, I think he might get it. <laughs> he, might get it. <laughs> he might get it. That's I mean, my theory. You know, it's like to Tommy it. Boy running up. Bees, bees, run for your life. <laughs> we should become like true crime podcast investigators, and we should hand down to Braintree and get to the bottom of this story. I think of we how should. These cho- also, I, I don't like the idea. If the Chocolate Labs didn't do anything, I don't like the idea of them taking the fall for this. Well, yeah. I mean, they can't. What, are they going to revoke their CDLs? Come on. Those dogs are not. This was not preventable. Not, not for metal. <laughs> hey, NASA! NASA's back on Friday. We're talking about those big, giant crawlers. It's going to be an awesome show, plus plenty of other guests. Find me on Twitter, at Timothy Dooner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Find him at Vincent the Dude. Find the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Look up What the Truck. Download the Freightways TV app and watch out faces. Stick around for more Freightways TV. Tell them how to be. Hey, peace and love, everybody. Spread it everywhere.